This is Guilty Conscience. Casual discussions on transfer pricing, tax treaties, and related topics. A podcast from Skadden that invites thought leaders and industry experts to discuss pressing transfer pricing issues, international tax reform efforts, and tax administration trends. We also dig into the innovative approaches companies are using to navigate the international tax environment and address the obligation everyone loves to hate. Now your hosts, Skadden Partners David Farhat and Nate Carden. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Guilty Conscience. As always, Nate Carden, David Farhat, Stefan Victor. Iman is still out on leave, so we're joined by Elon Bryant. Elon, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? Hi, I'm Elon Bryant. I'm an associate in Skadden's Palo Alto office. My practice is focused on tax controversy. I primarily defend taxpayers in the IRS audit and administrative appeals stage. Glad to have you. Today, we have a great episode featuring Mike McDonald from Ernst & Young. Mike's going to talk with us about developments in transfer pricing over the last 20 years. You're going to hear us debate Dempy because we have very different views on what the guidelines say and what they mean. And we're going to get some history as well as some perspective on what's uh, going to happen going forward. Mike, welcome. Great to have you. Oh, thanks very much, Nate. I'm happy to be here. So I guess to start this out, we look at these words in the transfer pricing guidelines, development, enhancement, maintenance, protection, exploitation. Where did they come from? And maybe you can explain to us your role in creating this situation. Okay, so just to start in the middle of thing. At the time, we called it the Great Beps. The origin of Dempy was really, in my view, it was trying to incorporate something that was also incorporated in the U.S. regs, and it was trying to deal both with the legal status of, of IP ownership versus so-called economic ownership. And the, the principle that was ultimately laid out in the 42 regulations is there's really only legal ownership. But that's not the end of the story. If, if there are contributions made by uh, an entity other than the legal owner, hey, make sure you pay them. So it's a fairly obvious concept, at least we thought. And I think that Dempy at the time was basically trying to achieve the same thing. It, it followed on the, the intangibles chapter, which again, I think did the same thing. It scrubbed the transfer pricing guidelines of this term called economic ownership. You actually won't see it anywhere. But in addition, it also made the, I thought, obvious point that um, legal ownership is not determinative. You have to pay those that contribute to, to that to that ownership. In the case of intangibles, some of the relevant contributions, and then at that point we started doing a list, Nate, where we said, well, de development's important, enhancement and maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, and then it became an acronym, and we lost control of the concept. Well, I, I mean, I think some people in interpreting maybe forgot about the mandate under which we were working at the time, right? If you go back to the beginning of the BEPS project, it really could have been a, a, um, an open discussion of, hey, is arm's length the best? Are there other things out there? Which I think that question is being addressed now. But at the time it was, hey, we have to stay within the four corner of arm's length. And that that means something to those of us that actually were doing the writing, and it means functions, assets, and risks. I actually think because it, it was written in the context of the arm's length principle, and because the words that are actually in the guidance were actually very carefully drafted, to me it's unambiguous that an interpretation that is functions, 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 just doesn't align with the actual 
text of the transfer pricing guideline. I think a notion where Dempy is something that trumps even a more traditional analysis of functions, assets, and risks, I, I actually just don't think it, it is supportable. And again, the thing that differentiates to me Article 9 and Article 7, transfer pricing versus PE profit attribution, is a respect for risk, putting capital at risk, right? That's part of the functions and that, that's part of the underlying fundamental aspects of the arm's length principle. And if you ignore that, it's a different system, but it's not arm's length. I really do think that the text is actually fairly clear. Why do you think there was a move to this functions, 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 as you call it, by some jurisdictions? Well, it's hard to really get into the heads of the other delegates, but it is something that 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 preceded the BEPS discussion. You know, I was delegate going back to two, 2002, I think, was the first year when we were working on the Article 7 stuff, which, of course, there is a primacy about functions there because risks and assets are determined endogenously, right, based on functions. I just perceived there was sort of a, a carryover to that idea, even when we were fully back within Article 9, talking about functions, assets, and risks. I don't know. I, I think it is easier to put your mind around functions, right? You can see it. It's the R&D activity, these very smart people doing things. And it, it might actually be easier to try to put, to, to, to think of, an appropriate outcome in terms of functions. But that being said, you know, if you do that to the exclusion of providing appropriate remuneration to capital put at risk, you're you're doing something and it may be principled in some way, but it 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 it's not it's not arm's length. Global dealing was an area where it really was the activities were so integrated, it was very difficult to to apply sort of the normal methods to it, right? And so that's why there's a special global dealing regulations. There's a special chapter in the authorized OECD approach that that says, look, this this just given the integrated nature of this, it just seems to make sense to do a profit split based on relative payroll. And to that point, Mike, I think if you look at the the guidance in many other instances, it it it, it takes global dealing out, right? It talks about financial services separately and sends you to the to the PE report. I think folks like me could take some of the blame for this functions um, fixation. But it's not our fault. It's that folks don't really listen. Because I think Mike made, made a good critique there where he talked about kind of looking at functions, assets, and risks. If you go back to the AOA and you look at even Article 7, there is attention paid to those assets and risks. And when you look at where it allows you to use some of these principles in an Article 9 context, it specifically talks about capital and specifically talks about assets and how those should be remunerated. So while, yes, global dealing is different, I think that's only a piece of it. The other piece of it is it explicitly deals with how you treat risk and explicitly deals with how you treat, treat assets. And those of us who kind of spend a lot of time in financial services, we get really comfortable with risk. And I think that's where you lose some of the folks in kind of widget TP where they're not as explicit with risk. I guess it's our experience with the regulators and, you know, the business and financial serv services is all about risk. So you have to be comfortable with it. While on the other hand, I think in one of, the, one of our other episodes, Nate, you say most of your clients, you only deal with winners. That causes kind of a, 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 a <laughs> an ability to neglect risk because you don't see it, right? I'm not an apologist for the arm's length principle, b believe it or not. I mean, it's basically the environment that I worked under when I was at Treasury and representing the U.S. at the OECD. It just strikes me that a lot of the discussion around functions, it really is just an untested basis to apportion profits. And what I mean by that is there's kind of two frameworks for debate and discussion. And the first is what I'll call the unconstrained one, which is... 
okay, how exactly do we interpret the 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 remit to d- properly distribute a portion and allocate profits? You know what what four eighty two the statute says, and so there's a that that's sort of a of an unconstrained question: arm's length versus something else, right? And and we can debate that. But there's another framework, and, and it's the framework that I operated on, as I said, under my years at Treasury, which is more constrained, which is given that the arm's length principle has been adopted, um, how can it best be articulated to avoid BEPs, be administrable, et cetera, et cetera. To the extent that, that, that we, we being the countries around the world, are departing from the arm's length principle, that, you know, that's fine. But it kind of needs to go through the type of gating questions that the arm's length principle has gone under and continues to go through. Gating questions like, can it actually be internationally agreed and incorporated in domestic law and treaties in a way that that everyone can agree to it? Can it be administered with a, a minimum amount of ambiguity? To what extent can it be manipulated by taxpayers or governments to sort of thwart objectives? What are the ricochet effects? You know, is it going to cause jobs to move overseas and things like that? And again, it's certainly fine to sort of say, let's let's take a functional based approach and and see how it works. But we can't just kind of half ass it. It strikes me. It's like, okay, if we want to do something else, fine. But let's let's make it go through those those gating questions. So, Mike, on that on that point, let me defend some of the folks that may go functions, functions, functions for a little bit. So I'm a jurisdiction. I go, look. If I look at FS, they have regulators and they have to put their risk in, in, in certain places. But when I look at the kind of widget folks. You guys are in the Wild West, you know, you can put your risk anywhere. Um, is that really arm's length when I say, look, you can put your risk in a sunny island somewhere, never really realize it, move your, your, your profits, have base erosion, however you want. But I can look at where you have your real functions and I'm saying, no, your risk is really there. Your risk is really with the people. And I can audit that. I can follow that. I can see that. And I don't think, you know, smart folks like Nate Stefan and Yulon can manipulate that as much. So if I'm a government. I look at where these things are being done and I'm saying, no, I'm not necessarily taking a functions, functions, functions approach. I'm saying there should be very little to this sunny island where you're holding your risk, Um, but everything should go with where you're actually doing these things. I guess the question, David, I'd have is for those tax authorities that say that is how come it always works out that the most important functions are the ones that are in your country? It's amazing. Is it just a happy coincidence that it always turns out that the risks are born in your country and the the winner's profits go to you? It Why doesn't it ever work out in somebody else's favor if it's actually administrable? And that goes, I think, to one of the gating questions, right? I, I do think it's fair for us to say, hey, what about a functions-based approach? But Nate, you're, you're talking about maybe one of the principles. Is that something that can actually be internationally agreed and provide some basis for agreement and avoidance of double tax and things like that. Well, my response to that would be, well, I only care about what's in my country. I can't enforce the tax laws in another jurisdiction. That's not good enough, I would say, okay. to such a proponent of that view, right? Okay. If, 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 if we are agreeing that, that it's good to have an international tax system yeah. in which, in fact, there is some coordination, so it's that, that's separate from not respecting a country's sovereign rights, but but having some coordination so that there can be just singular taxation, right? As long as that's important, I, I think taking a view of, uh, I'm really just concerned with what's in my jurisdiction is is completely self-defeating to that to that larger view. And I'm not sure that that could pass the, the gating tests that, that all of these things have to go through. Well, my response to that, Mike, would be, okay, <laughs> okay, I I hear you, but that's why we have a treaty process. We we have it. We have a treaty process. We have a map process. If country A does this and country B does that, taxpayer, go to map, do an APA. Let's hash it out. Let's talk about what's in their jurisdiction versus what's in my jurisdiction. Fair enough in theory, but my gosh, I mean, the, it, things have to be ground in something, and and 
the, the, the type of disputes about which lab coats are smarter, you know, it just sounds like, again, it, it, in some sense, it's more tangible because you can count people, right? And and then that's fine. In fact, this is one of the experiments that's going on in, in the OECD now where they're having, they're counting people and they're going to see how that works out. But again, if 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 ultimately we want something that that can somehow be internationally agreed, and and as a starting point have some basis for that agreement, and I don't think even even having access to map, I think is just going to lead to even more lengthy disputes because no one has anything really to anchor it in. When you were describing the the stuff on an island. I don't think you were properly describing what the arm's length principle is, right? Because there's there is a discipline to it, at, you know, at least in theory. And we can talk about how how the theory breaks down. But the discipline is there's no free lunch, and and, and maybe to expand on it, there's no ex ante risk adjusted free lunch. That is there there's a valuation aspect and and there's a lot of empirical work behind that valuation work including how to value risks that are all part and parcel of the arm's length principles not just this island owns this this one does that it's like hey there needs to be a mechanism that that ultimately ensures that there's no free lunch and I think people maybe are overlooking the, the people that are quick to get beyond the BEPS one guidance and go to functions are actually overlooking what I think are some fairly powerful valuation contributions that, that were made to, to, to address some of these shortcomings of, of respecting an entity putting risk in one location or another. I'd also say more broadly that in addition to ignoring the valuation principles, and I think these points are tied together, the description of what's going on in islands, et cetera, really is imagining a world that disappeared right around 2010, right? That's just not what people are doing anymore. Now we have real countries and I certainly put places that sometimes get a lot of flack, like Ireland, where they absolutely punch above their weight from a transfer pricing perspective into the category of real countries. So I guess I just don't know how you get international agreement when we're not talking about what's happening in a country versus a brass plaque. We're talking about what's happening in one country versus what's happening in another. Why... Should we believe that any of that analysis is really credible? Because I have a real tough time with it. Which analysis are, we, are you referring to, Nate? What? An analysis that compares whether one lab coat is smarter than another lab coat, or whether marketing is more important than R&D, or how to think about the relative value of these people. In some ways, it seems to me entirely contrary to every business that I work with to think that one group is foundational and another group is not. And yes, we could always go to map, but in my experience, at least, we just end up sitting around in map because there's no North Star to guide the competent authorities to a resolution. We will just slug out every case. We're always going into the octagon and seeing, seeing who comes out less bloodied and bruised. I, I guess... Mike, though, as you've watched this happen really over the course of the last 20 years, were there signs of it earlier than what it least appears to all of us on who have always been on the outside that this was headed in a direction that was going to result in the amount of disagreement that at least I see? Or was there a consensus when the BEPS 8 through 10 report was issued and when the guidelines were issued that just kind of evaporated? I did actually see it coming and it did follow our work on the authorized OECD approach, right? The attribution of profits to PE, which as I said before, was by necessity functions-based, right? Because it's a single enterprise and you don't actually have separate capital and, and assertions of risk. We just saw as we went into business restructuring and to um, 
some of the other projects that that there were a lot of a lot of countries that that really seemed to be putting a real weight on on functions. Um, and at the time, I, I guess I just thought it was type of the really sort of the normal give and take among countries about trying to properly articulate the relative importance of functions, assets, and risks. I did perceive even prior to BEPS, but especially in BEPS, that I think there was a skepticism that 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 valuation techniques could properly address BEPS. Related to that skepticism, I think was was more of a tolerance than I think the U.S. had to to recharacterize transaction, right? And then and then so once you get to those two steps, the third would be, well, what might be the the most appropriate way to, in my view, recharacterize it would maybe be to focus on, you know, functions, who's doing what. Don't trust the ability. Maybe they didn't trust the ability to properly evaluate risks. Maybe they didn't take the comfort that I that I think we, the U.S., took in some of the strengthened valuation guidance. And maybe it reflects an underlying dissatisfaction with the arm's length principle without actually expressing it that way. So, Mike, how much of this, and even the current environment, how much of this is more of I'm fine with the arm's length standard so long as it works for me, right? So I can look at the functions, and I think Nate made a good point. I'm looking at the functions that are in my jurisdiction. Um, I think there's a lot of that when we're looking at the pillar one and pillar two and this kind of departure from the uh, arm's length standard, because I think you see in recent years, some of the biggest proponents over time of the arm's length standard are now doing things that are very much not arm's length. We're seeing the DPT, we're seeing the B. We're seeing the digital services tax. So while you had folks who were very happy with the arm's length standard for a long time, are now all of a sudden no longer happy with it. So how much of this is, if it works for me, it's good. If it's if it doesn't work for me, then I'm going to do something else. I know you're going to scoff at this, but, but I, I always thought one of the strengths of the arm's length principle, if done properly, is its inherent neutrality? Is its inherent neutrality compared compared to compared to all alternatives? Well, I would I would argue that all if you look at all principles in general are 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 neutral until you apply it. And I think it's just you can make that argument with the arms length standard. I think if you just step back and say the arms length standard, that's that's fine. But when you start applying it, then it becomes. <laughs> I, I mean, I really do think that the theory of the arm's length principle is that it was really attempting to to try to allocate profits according to economic contributions, and I think I think there is a neutrality to that in concept that that I think is is the reason why people signed on to the language of Article Nine. Now, in trying to apply it, you're right, it's a big mess. I think it's very healthy, David, that, that right now there's, there is an alternative to the arm's length principle that is actually going through the gating process I talked about. According to market jurisdiction, it's like a VAT mentality, right? If that's a principle, and it is now being vetted, and some key questions are, is it something that can be internationally agreed and 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 provide the basis for domestic law and treaties in a way that 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 leads to agreement and i think you're right countries are quite naturally looking at this and saying how would i fare you know given the size of my market and given the other economic contributions that are being made like i have a small market but our country has firms that have really good technical ability and R and D and other things. How am I gonna fare under this system? Does a North Star look like a range that companies or jurisdictions would kind of adhere to or anchor themselves? It, it, for for which system? I mean I, I perhaps it can apply to all systems? Some sort of a range concept? Yeah. A few of you but have have mentioned like, you know, having a North Star to kind of ease some of the the uncertainty or 
give provide more guidance and and what does that north star actually look like and how far are we away from that there ultimately has to be an agreement on a particular amount to me the question is can the concept of a range be such that it could provide some comfort that that actual amount is reasonable and can be accepted now the arm's length principle does have some empirical um what they call it joint in the bones to to try to provide some some reasonable give as to where the results could fall so now the questions are what about some of these alternatives which for example if it's based on functions it seems uh, what, what what's your flexibility counting heads versus payroll stefan from my perspective on your question I think it's going to be extraordinarily hard because I, I think we are getting to a point where countries are maybe not just becoming dissatisfied with the notion of the arm's length principle. I actually think countries are getting dissatisfied with the notion of income taxation as we would historically think about it, right? And are moving to things like DSTs, which are a gross revenue tax that effectively really operates like a VAT. And with that emphasis on we are going to tax economic activity based on where our people are and where the commercial transactions are occurring rather than where value is created, I think it's going to be very difficult to achieve a North Star within the context of anything that looks like income tax. Because if you really think about it, the BEPS 8 through 10 report, which came out in 2015, said what we want to do is align transfer pricing with value creation. Seven years later, I think the emerging consensus of the international community is, no, we don't. That's a bad idea. And so I think, I think finding that North Star is going to be profoundly difficult, to be honest. And another thing about your question, Stefan, I, I agree with you, Nate, it's gonna be very hard to find that, but I think Mike made a good point. 80 years ago, there were certain voices around the table. Now, there are a lot more voices around the table. As the environment has changed, and as the voices have, have, have changed or become more numerous, and I think as the um, businesses have become more sophisticated, you see this dissatisfaction. And finding a North Star, even if you move away from the arm's length standard or you move away from income tax, I think will be very difficult just because everyone has competing interests. Um, so do we want to go all the way down the line of, do we now forget about the concept of nation states <laughs> before we get to somewhere where folks are satisfied? But I think so long as you have these, um, what I'll call old school uh, uh, thoughts around taxation, and some of these old school rules, you will have this dissatisfaction and you will have a very hard time finding a North Star. Mike, when you were part of all these discussions, where do incentives come in? Because one of the things that I struggle with mightily with Dempy and a functions-based approach is that in all honesty, if the question is put to me, how much Dempy can I put in a particular jurisdiction? The real answer is, how much do I need to? And people are highly mobile, functions are mobile, and countries, I think, want to attract these kinds of jobs and the kind of talent that goes along with them. And so a functions-based approach seems to me to give a pretty strong incentive for multinationals to try to put their people in spots that are going to be tax attractive. And yet it seems to me that the countries that are most strongly proponents, at least in the cases that I work on, of a functions-based approach are also the ones that are most bothered by tax competition. So where did that part of it fit into the discussions? Well, th that's the thing. There, there was never, I think, a direct discussion along those lines. And instead, a functions-based approach kind of got there in in indirectly because it would be one thing as i said before for us to say let's talk about a functions based approach and nate part of the gating issues would be what are the ricochet effects if your basis of taxation is functions what is that going to mean because policymakers that are trying to do this 
as opposed to the technical writers who were said to work under the arm's length principle, the real policymakers would want to know if we go to a functions-based system, yes, we can count heads, but those heads might move, right? And they might move to a place that maybe is contrary to other policy objectives that our country has, like retaining jobs in our country. Let me be practical a little bit. So if I'm dealing with country A and country A has taken this kind of functions, functions, functions approach with DEMPI, um, as you mentioned, the guidelines don't necessarily support that. What is a strategy for dealing with that? Can I then say, okay, if you want to look at a kind of DEMPI based profit split or a profit split, we then have to have something for the assets. We then have to have something for risk. Um, what What's What's a strategy for kind of, you know, pushing back on that? Well, it, it, if one reads what's there, it's not as if functions aren't given their, their proper place, right? Functions can be important. And, and a lot of the, you know, the practical profit splits that are actually done after you re remunerate routine it is basically to look at, for example, capitalized and amortized R&D and things like that. Functions are actually very important and they can be a way to essentially split residual profits uh, under under that method if it's if it's the best but david what i would say is again the 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 anchor of the transfer pricing guidelines still is understand what the actual transaction is right and the actual transaction has to incorporate where risk is born it doesn't ignore risks then it gives some guidance it, and it doesn't say risk is where functions are. That That's the AOA. That's not Article 9. And so to, to me, if there's if there's strictly a functions, functions, functions based approach and and one points out that ignores the appropriate remuneration to risk and capital put at risk, that itself should should clearly indicate that there is a fundamental problem with that that needs to be addressed. We're supposed to be operating under a regime in which all contributions are supposed to count, right? Including capital put at risk. If there's a method that 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 actively ignores what should be clear sources of value contribution, then it can't be right. What we're trying to say here is not functions, functions, functions. It's that assets and risks without function are a cause for skepticism. And I think that would, I think that principle, if you articulate it to tax authorities, even the strong dempy ones, at least starts to get some resonance. In support of that, there's an example in the guidelines. It's my favorite example is example six of, of uh, chapter six on intangibles that basically sort of paints at, at, at first blush some of the things that, that countries were very skeptical. That is this IP hub, right, that, that had the IP and very little else. And the example starts out by saying, look, I'm paying an arm's length R&D compensation. Look at me. Look at me. I'm paying an arm's length distribution. Look at me. I'm in another route. And, and therefore, you should accept the fact that I get everything in, in return, right? And the example basically says, no, 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 no. There, the, one needs to sort of look at realistic alternatives, right? And if you actually look at what's going on, that entity was simply contributing its capital and that's all. And on an ex-ante basis, the example shows, hey, the bulk of the anticipated return should go to these entities that are actually performing. So example six basically says, um, it basically tries to address the skepticism by saying you don't simply accept some notion of an arm's length service without taking a step back and using realistic alternatives. Realistic alternatives, I think, was another powerful part of the guidance. It's been in the regulations forever, but it ha but has it really been interpreted the way I think it should have as a valuation concept? Realistic alternative is a tool that allows countries or taxpayers to take a step back and say, hold on a second, it, 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 does this pass the smell test? Because if something doesn't pass the smell test, odds are a realistic alternatives framework could can identify 
that. So does this uncertainty create more of a burden or an opportunity for companies? I appreciate that question, Stefan, and that's where I wanted to go. I think it creates an opportunity for companies. It's because listening to what Nate and, and Mike went through, to boil it down is do the hard work, do it up front. And I think the onus is put on the taxpayer to make sure that this work is done. Because if you go back to our episode on kind of ex ante expo transfer pricing and kind of the disadvantage that the government is in, you can have some, you know, empathy for the government going functions, 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 because they're looking at this, you know, four, five, six years, and you need to find something that's auditable, something that you can get to, right? So doing the work up front and kind of holding the government's hand through some of this, I know sometimes it's an adversarial pr a process, as you can tell us, but that is an opportunity, I think, for taxpayers to do this work up front. Make sure your documentation is detailed enough to have all of this. Make sure your audit file has this. Think about APA's map to kind of put yourself in the position to have this discussion. Because I think nine times out of 10, tax authorities can go through this process and will go through this process, even though it may not be easy. But you have to have that information. What's, what's been interesting to me is IRS certainly, in my experience, loves function interviews, right? Interview various executives, asking where people are, where, where people are, what they do what exactly. But at least I feel like at the end of the day, United States is very interested in really challenging the pricing of the transaction rather than recasting, right, the entire transaction. I don't know if that's, that's your guys' experience too. And, and, you know, they do all that, they go through all that work, right, to kind of check your functions and whatnot. But at the end of the day, it is a big, valuation fight. Um, I don't know if you guys think which fight is better. Maybe you do both. I am curious, David, you you sat on the other side of the table on this for a while. It always feels to me like a lot of effort is put into functional interviews. And then when it actually comes time to determine how much tax to pay, we just open up Microsoft Excel and there's a model. Is that fair or are the functional interviews really being used for something? What is it being used for? The, the, the functional interviews are, are, are really good. And I can put my IRS hat back on. It, what it taught you about the business, right? Because I'm in the, in the IRS, one of the things I always felt like I had a disadvantage on was I felt like I knew the transfer pricing, but I didn't know the business as well as the business people or the advisors. So the functional interviews really, really helped. Um, and also it's hard to interview you know, the assets are hard to interview around risk, right? You do the functional interviews to figure out where the risk should be, but you want to understand what, who, who these people are, what they do, what they're going to say to you. Um, and as an IRS person, it was always great to interview some of these PhDs that had been described as routine, because when they get in the room and they start talking to you, they tell you they're everything but routine. And you would always get some of these gems in these interviews that you could use for those wonderful spreadsheets to get the, to, to get the allocation. So to make to, to long, long answer short, the functional interviews were great because they didn't just give you a view into the functions. They gave you a view into the business so that you could do that risk allocation on your own as well. One other question I have as I listen to it is, is this a distinctly American way to think about it? And do we have more skill, especially in the tax administration area, thinking this way? I think of something like our functional cost diagnostic model at ATMA, right, which is a very sophisticated Excel spreadsheet uh, designed to implement a residual profit split method. David, from your experience and Mike, from yours as well, is Part of the gap here that we just have a bunch of Americans that are used to working with these numbers and formulas, and by advocating this, we're really just advocating for the what helps the U.S. Well, I think part of it is arch, you know, being Americans, and we're dealing with a lot of capital exporters, whether we're in the government or in, in the private sector. So we have a certain view of the world. I think that view will line up maybe with folks in the U.K. Um, mm -hmm. And given my competent authority experience, you saw that the U.S. and the U.K. were aligned on a lot of things, especially in the financial services area. But you start looking at the rest of Europe, you start looking at Canada, and you start looking at parts of Asia and even South America, you see a different view because they're capital importers. So it's not that I think we're 
more comfortable looking at the spreadsheets or doing the economic analysis is that we, our point of view is shaped by where we practice and, 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 and what we do. It would always be uh, relevant, but I think it depends on the, the, the where you get your training and what you th and how you think about about income tax. So yes, we can all get comfortable with this because we're we're Americans and we're used to capital exporting. But you give us some time with some capital importing clients, and we may we we may sing a different tune. Now, I don't think the U.S. is better at modeling and empirical work than other countries. I think if if there's a difference, it's it, it kind of turned around is that the U.S. might be more uh, amenable to respecting the taxpayer's transaction and trying to get to the right economic answer through valuation, as opposed to recharacterizing the transaction and pricing that other transaction. So as we move toward the end here, We've talked a lot about how we got here. We talked a lot about the problem that we have, but how does this get resolved? What do you think, Mike, from what you're seeing in your cases and what you saw in your in your 20 years of service, what do you see as the way that countries get realigned given the transfer pricing guidelines we have? Here's my view. We are right now not at a long-term equilibrium. Right now, we're at a point of disequilibrium. And the reason is because the guidance came out fairly recently, right? And so countries are putting different different English on it. It's a disequilibrium, though, because it's. I don't think it's sustainable to have this schism go on. And I'm actually a little bit, maybe naively, um, optimistic that... that things are, are actually going to get better. I mean, it's too bad that we're not actually giving BEPS one enough chance to sort of fully play itself out be, before we go to BEPS two. But, but for example, Nate, we, we, we are seeing a recognition among some governments, European, that recognizing the fact that, that there seems to be a great deal more disagreements right now on the ground and a great deal of time being being spent going through very detailed functional type questions that lead to recharacterization and and they're actually taking a step back and saying this can't be the best way are there other things that that can be done and i know i'm a broken record but I, but i actually think that is that the OECD guidance as written and properly interpreted, it still may lead to a way forward. Because again, just because there's more of a tendency to accept a taxpayer's deal, right? So that you don't have to always argue about what the real deal is, doesn't mean that it's susceptible to BEPS given some of the valuation principles that have been developed over the last 10 years to deal with BEPS. I just think that people's focus right now, a country's focus, are inappropriately too much on recharacterization. I think that's not sustainable. And I, I actually think things are going to come more towards reliance on the valuation guidance in the future. This was a, was a lot of fun. Um, thanks so much for your time, Mike, and thanks so much for joining us, Yolan. But this has been Guilty Conscience. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Guilty Conscience. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss any future conversations. Skadden's tax team is recognized globally for providing clients with creative and innovative solutions to their most pressing transactional, planning, and controversy challenges. Additional information about Skadden can be found at skadden.com. 